as you know, Sid, the wine industry is very traditional. Mm. It's very slow to change. And one of the things that many wineries are realizing now is there's a whole new generation of consumer mm. out there that's not married to the cork. Mm. And this is a new mindset for wineries to, to get into. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, CEO of Beverage Trade Network, and we're right here filming with Mark Kaufman. He's a sommelier and also represents bulk winery out of Italy. So we're going to talk about how wineries, especially overseas winery, trying to crack a U.S. market and grow their private label business. You know, what are some tips from him? You know, what are the lessons he's learned? And then lastly, we're going to touch base on sustainability and packaging and what's going on, you know, as for him. So thanks, Mark. Thanks for joining me here. My pleasure, Sid. Good to see you. Super. Yeah. Why don't you give our audience a little bit of, uh, you know, context about your journey and you, you've, where, you've been chatting, like you've been doing a lot of different things. So how you started and, and what are you up to these days? I do. Well, thank you. Um, I actually got involved in wine when I went to college. I went to the University of Bordeaux and uh, just accidentally kind of got into wine and then went into the restaurant business when nice. I came back to the States after college. So you, so you're originally activity. from France or are you just uh, no, I'm, for I'm originally from the U.S. All right. uh, and I was studying French and political science. That's a great basis for the wine business. Nice. Uh, and I came back to the States and went into the restaurant business full time. I was director of beverage operations for about 15 years wow. for a national restaurant group. Got my sommelier accreditations from uh, Court of Master Sommeliers, from uh, uh, Society of Wine Educators, and from uh, uh, another group in France. So I have three sommelier certifications. And I do now uh, wine tastings for corporate groups yep. for uh, the sommelier company, which is part of um, vintage wine, vintage wine uh, uh, estates. And um, we do those both virtually and, and now live events coming back. Thankfully. And that, those tastings are for the end consumers? Those are for, yeah, mostly corporate groups, team building, uh, but yes, for for consumers, where we actually mail them bottles of wine, Okay. and then we go on either a Zoom call or I show up at the facility, mm -hmm. and we do a full-scale tasting. We do them for wine, we do them for tequila or bourbon or scotch. Yeah, it's a multitude of, multitude of things. And then I'm also a uh, representative for uh, a large bulk wine producer in Italy, and yep. that's how I got involved with the bulk wine show. Uh, in July in South San Francisco, which is a great show for us. We've made practically all of our contacts there. We've been there since day one with the show. True. And we look forward to it each year because that's where I get to meet the buyers for the large retailers and the private label wines that, that we do. Yep. And we do the most popular varieties, Sangiovese, Pinot Grigio, and things like that, that are brought over basically in bulk, flex tanks, and then bottled here in the US. So right. it's, a, it's a, a savings for one thing, over bringing bottled wine over. Yep. And, um, and it gives us a chance to just spread our contacts every year. Got so it. It, it works out very well. On, on the sales process for the bulk mm -hmm. wine, you know, uh, sales or private label sales, like what, what kind of sales process do you have, which is very, I would say, in a process format, you know, do you have like a lead generation, uh, which you do, you know, uh, cold calling, which you do, prospecting that you do, and then sampling targets you may have right. for yourself. You know, Absolutely. like I, I need to make sure 50 samples are going out. Uh, what are the closing questions? So walk me over like, you sure. know, your biz dev for that. Sure, well, we have a director of uh, exports okay. who is based at the winery in, uh, Italy. in Emilia Romagna. And she and I coordinate the work for North America. But basically we get most of our leads through the trade shows. Mm -hmm. We do the bulk wine show here and the one in Amsterdam. Okay. And that really generates a lot of leads. Cortecchia, they've been in business 60 years, they're family owned and they export to 20 countries now. Mm. So they've built up quite a, a base of consumers and we're always looking for more, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but we find that the trade shows are really the best way to do it. And we make the first contact mm -hmm. there at the show and then the winery prepares fresh samples and air freights them right, right to the customer. Mm -hmm. So they get the, the chance to taste the samples fresh. We can do custom blending then if they come back and say they want the wine a little sweet or they would mm -hmm. like to do a blend of say Cabernet Sangiovese. We have all that capability. The winery has very modern 
Got it. Uh, what, what's your elevator pitch. pitch for the trade show? You know, when, when someone's walking by, let's just go right in the sales mode, right? Like when someone's walking by, you say, how do you, how do you represent, how do you introduce that you are a bulk producer? Hi, this is uh, the opportunity for you to taste some great wines from Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the way for you to get the freshest and the best quality products that, that are available. And because it's a family owned winery, we work on a really on a one-to-one -one basis. You're not dealing with a big conglomerate type of operation. So uh, I like to bring people in on a on a personal level, one-to-one, -one, and ask them, you know, what are you looking for hmm. uh, to satisfy your needs? Because quite honestly, I meet several people that are just starting out on the journey, hmm. and they're buyers for maybe smaller groups that don't really understand the difference between the bulk wine hmm. and a bottled you know, a bottled private label project. Hmm. So uh, we, we deal with larger quantities, quite frankly, but we are starting to look at now being able to supply bottled wine. What are, the, what are the three or four questions that normally a big bulk winery, or a winery out here looking for bulk wine would ask you immediately that you know that that's a qualified buyer? Um, well, the first thing uh, they're, they're asking about usually is the cost, uh -huh. uh, the price. Uh, you have to be competitive. And uh, it's not really a problem because uh, of the large volume that you guys Cortec, do. Yeah, yeah, we respond very much to that. We're very much in touch with the market because we're selling in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we're also selling in North America and in the Far East. Mm -hmm. So we're very much in tune with the customer uh, needs and the markets there as far as the pricing of the products are concerned. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of times they want to know how they can actually, how they can bottle it. So I have people over here, I have references that I can give them mm -hmm. for bottlers because that's mm -hmm. very important. Um, and, and they want to know just how does the system work. Mm. So they have to get the sample, they taste it, and if they, they like it, then basically we set up the process for them to be able to bring in the tanker. But most of the, most of the buyers for the larger companies, they're familiar with the process. Got it. Okay, but I'm glad to walk new people through it, and we, we meet people every year that aren't that familiar with it, and I've taken some step by step mm -hmm. and brought them, brought them on board, and it, it, it's fun to do. And how much of this is like more of a spot market thing versus a long-term ongoing buyer? We work with both uh, situations. Okay. I have several companies that year to year we have agreements with that buy the same mm -hmm. uh, or that are looking for the same things and we get inquiries all the time for for spot buys of different wines mm -hmm. that uh, yeah that that, that uh, like m more the wine clubs mm -hmm. they're more the spot buyers all right because they have they try to vary their selections so uh, they look for certain things at certain times. And doing outbound sales or biz dev for this is very tough because actually you don't know which winery has what gap, right? What, what they're looking for. It's not a public data. Exactly. Right? So I'm sure being in the trade for many years, you, you know that which winery buys, or maybe you have that pulse or s some research you're doing where you know that, okay, maybe you, you are the person out there shopping for Chardonnay, so let me come and say hello to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm so in I know contact that, with a lot of buyers. So let's say, you know, a brokerage firms like Tarentine or Ciari right. uh, do this kind of thing, but how do you know which winery have what needs? Well, I've done a lot, I've done a lot of research okay. to find out which wineries so, are, are so interested in you... imports, M mostly through call, email, and, and things like that. Now, since the pandemic, I was uh -huh. on the road a lot before the pandemic, sure and getting back out on it now. I, I do deal with Ciotti. Got it. Uh, somewhat. Just to help some but, of our yeah. bulk wine producers, right? What kind of uh, producers or, or wineries in US or maybe other parts of the world you think would qualify as a minimum bulk wine buyer? Otherwise, let's not bother calling. Well, I deal with wines from Italy as far as bulk wines are concerned, primarily. Mm -hmm. I get occasional requests for other things. But primarily, the first qualifier is you have to want to sell Italian wine. Hmm. So that uh, there are some wineries, California wineries, that sell foreign wine hmm. as well. Some of the larger, some of the top ten hmm. people have foreign wine programs. A lot of it is for bag and box, but it's I'm but sure. it's but it's bulk. But most of my customers are more large retail chains and wine clubs, and uh, uh, and entities like that rather than wineries themselves. Got it. 
we sell a lot of wine in Europe to other wineries yep. that use it in blends because in Europe there is some bulk wines in the lower price spectrum, just EU white, EU red. Mm -hmm. We sell a lot of that, which goes to wineries that just put it into you know, mm -hmm. large uh, general Appalachian blends. But over here, the demand is for much more specific, higher quality wine, like Sangiovese Reserva, mm -hmm. uh, Pinot Grigio. For a private we, label Yeah, project. for private label projects, right. Got it. One of the things that I've always found is, you know, big buyers, which let's say you may be dealing with, or even regional chains like Festival Foods and Specs and so on, sure. right? They're still big size compared right. to the world. Because of the three-tier system, you know, they would have their state distributors or maybe a bottling company you may have to go through like O'Neill or Delicaro. So just give, give us a little uh, overview of, for this overseas people. Uh, many producers are like big in their countries, but then when, when they come here, they have to understand how am I going to even service Walmart? Right, well, if they're, if they're trying to sell their wine into the US, the first thing I tell, I tell a foreign supplier is, if you can sell all your wine in any other market than the US, do it. This is a very complicated market to sell in because of the three-tier system. Mm. The way it basically works is if you're a foreign winery, first you have to have a U.S. importer mm -hmm. to bring it in. Then, depending on where you want to sell it, you have to have a distributor in practically each state. Correct. And in some cases, the importer and the distributor can be the same Correct. company. In some cases, they're not. So you may end up dealing with two different companies to sell into one market. Yep. So it does get. I mean, so where I was going wa with mm -hmm. this was when you talk, having a meeting with Trader Joe's or any private label buyer or Aldi, let's say you would want uh, to show how you're going to fulfill the delivery, right? Right. Like, who are your state distributors? Who are your importers? Who's right. clearing the wine technically? Right. Uh, so working with those buyers, most of them already have a network. that network right. set up. So they say, don't worry, we'll handle this. Right, like Trader Joe's has their own importer. True. And, and they have their distribution network. I understand. So that's not so something not that we usually okay. right, tackle. It's the, the smaller groups that don't have that kind of system mm. or have not done imported wines before. That, th those people you have to walk through and in some cases I have helped them find an importer. I have an importer now that we can use mm. uh, to bring in samples and to clear wines in, but then they still have to have a distributor in their state if they're in Minnesota or Illinois or wherever. They have to have a local distributor who's willing to bring that wine in, hold it for them in the warehouse and deliver it to them hmm. as they need to. But that's a, a negotiation that really has to be done between the end buyer hmm. and the distributor. I mean, I can get involved to a small True. degree, but that's really more of a local. So let's say you got situation. a meeting, right? You, uh, for your pitch, for your private label program, for your winery, you know, uh, what's your approach? Like what do you present in your deck or meeting? Well, I show the history of the winery and get and uh, get them to know the people involved as much as possible because okay. it's a person-to-person -person mm. business and then find out what their needs are. I listen to them mm. and let them tell me what they're looking for. Mm. And then I can show them how we can get them the samples in the shortest amount of time, taste the wines, decide that it's what they want, and get the program on the road. They also have to design a label, which yeah, I can so, help them with. So you, okay. Yeah, yeah. You show them the options. Sure. We have ready a Ready to wear we, labels. We can, we can supply a ready-made label, or it'll, a lot of times they have their own already designed. Mm. But we're very flexible as far as that's concerned. And as mm. I say, we're just getting now set up to be able to bottle the wine in Italy. If they yep. want to do that, we can run that whole process for them. Okay. What about your Midas touch? Like, what is? What are your two or three things that you really nail it down? Where you know, like for example, when I sold wine, I used to say, Mark, you know, you were the sommelier, right? You're the buyer. I used to say, give me a chance, one case. I'll come Friday and Saturday and make sure it, it's out of your door. So, what, what's your sort of uh, buying confidence spiel? It's my sparkling personality, of course. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's the quality of the wine that we're right. selling. That's really the differentiation. But you are you putting get... your money on your words? Like, okay, we're going we're gonna to build back or buy back and replace or something if we, something goes wrong? We guarantee. We absolutely guarantee the wine up to the point of delivery and bottling. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with bulk wine, you really can't guarantee 
any more than that, that yeah. once they take it out of the container and bottle it. But we have a, a, a three-tier process to make sure that the wine is A, the wine that they sample, mm. B, the wine that is put into the container, and C, is the wine that they receive. We do a series of independent lab analysis of the wine before it ever leaves Italy. We send samples of the same wine that's being put into the tank to accompany the shipment and separate samples via, via express mail so that the buyer has samples when it arrives and has additional samples when the container arrives. So then they can compare they can compare it every step of the way. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. And we watch and track it and all that. Got it. Uh, it's important. True. I think uh, let, let's go on sustainability and packaging, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you that's your other hat. So, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. tell me what's going on in trends. Like we, we've all talking about sustainability. I think big retailers are pushing more and more now that even their suppliers need to be having sustainability. So give us a little two minutes on what are big retailers doing and how that move is impacting producers. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just at a conference on Friday where that was a topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of retailers and to some degree consumers are starting to realize that a wine bottle that weighs 12 pounds is maybe not the most ecologically sound packaging that mm. you can use. We're definitely starting to see a trend toward lighter weight bottles, which, which is good both from the retailer's point of view in that it's going to help them with sustainability and with the costs and with the producer's point of view mm. in that it's, it's a more ecologically sound uh, situation and all the way down the line it's lower, it's lower carbon emissions. Because when you look at the footprint, you have to look at cradle to grave. You can't just look at from the end, from the bottler to the consumer. Mm. You have to look at the overall cycle, which includes the recycling process. So, so let's take an example so, of this yep. you were saying, right? This is yeah, one, we're third getting of the, into, one third of the weight or something you said? Yeah, this is a plastic, this is a bottle made out of PET, okay. which is food grade plastic, and it contains a barrier for shelf life. So the shelf life on this product is 12 to 18 months once it's bottled. Mm. And uh, a lot of wineries are looking at PET as a replacement of glass for wines that are ready to drink. This mm. is not something you're gonna put into your cellar and age for 10 mm. years. But let's face it, 80 to 85% of all the wine that's produced in the world is consumed within 48 hours of purchase. Mm. So we know that for things like this, there's no reason to put it in a glass bottle that weighs mm. two and a half pounds. So on that, I just want to go there on uh, showing a financial benefit, mm -hmm. right? So you say, obviously, the weight becomes less for the container. How, in dollar terms, like, are they actually going to save 20% on the invoice of the overall freight from X winery to the... This weighs, uh, comparative weight, they're going to save about a third in the overall weight. So they can get 30% more product. Mm. on a shipment, Understood. on a truckload or on a container. So th there's the, definitely the savings in weight factor there. Yep. Yeah. Th th well, this is another innovation in bottles that's just come out. This is a, a flat mm -hmm. 750 milliliter wine bottle. Mm -hmm. It's called the Pacamama bottle. Mm -hmm. Right now it's only available in the UK and in Australia, mm -hmm. but it's coming to the US. And this is, a, this is a full one. And you can see compared to a glass bottle, it so weighs, what, what, what are the so utility nothing. benefits of this? Well, this was actually created in the UK because it literally fits through the mail slot mm -hmm. in the door. And in the UK, you can send wine through the mail, which you can't do in the US. So they created a package for a single bottle. So it was great for direct to consumer sales mm. uh, because it could literally go through the mail slot and they don't break. They don't. They're shatterproof. Mm. So uh, in shipping alone, there's a great advantage. Um, the other thing too is the closure that's on this. Uh, I work with a company that makes the closure and the closure is also made out of plastic. So you have plastic on plastic or this is a glass bottle. You can use it on glass bottle too. And what it does is it makes it completely recyclable mm. because if you have the typical metal closure on a glass bottle, a lot of recycling centers can't separate mm. the, the two. So it may go to landfill. But with this typical closure, it just burns up in the glass melt mm. when the glass is remelted, so it doesn't affect it. Plus, the application process is much simpler. Mm. For the typical metal closure, you need a machine that costs several thousand dollars, 
and there's a lot of pressure that's applied to actually mold the screw cap onto the glass. This is the only screw cap that can be applied by hand mm -hmm. to the glass bottle, just like this. Mm -hmm. It's and a lot now, of small batch. This is tough for, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it can be done by machine too. It's a much nice. less yeah, looks neat one labor too. intensive machine. And now this is sealed every bit as well as the metal closure and it has the same liner, the same interior liner. So to open mm -hmm. it, it's oh. tamper evident. Okay. Just like, just yeah. like glass. Just like the, the normal metal screw cap closure. It's called a Nova Twist. Mm -hmm. It was invented about 20 years ago by Tetra Pak, wow. and it's now made by a French company called Solo Cap. That's nice. a big uh, What, what are the trends uh, that you're seeing from the retailers? Like, are they, you know, uh, supporting suppliers with more sustainable packaging? Absolutely. There are now SKUs in all of the Scandinavian countries in the UK and in Canada for plastic bottles, specifically for wine bottled in PET, mm -hmm. which is great. And uh, it, it's, coming, it's coming here, uh, absolutely. I think the retailers probably in Europe have been much more active mm -hmm. in really pushing their suppliers to go to this type of packaging, to alternative packaging, mm -hmm. rather than uh, than the most of the retailers here. In the Why US. do you think wineries are not moving more into this? Obviously, it's the aesthetic value of the brand. That's one of the reasons. That's part of it. As you know, Sid, the wine industry is very traditional. Mm. It's very slow to change. And one of the things that many wineries are realizing now is there's a whole new generation of consumer mm. out there that's not married to the cork. Mm. And this is a new mindset for wineries to to get into. True. I mean, we're seeing it with screw caps. But the screw cap has been around for about 30, 35 years now. And here in the US, about maybe four out of every 10 bottles of wine are now screw cap, mm. as opposed to cork. But prior to that, the cork was the only innovation in wine bottling for 300 years. True. So it, it's, a, it's a slow industry What What are the change. opportunities, right? Like, you know, if you were consulted by a winery and they're asking you, okay, I want to, I want to change my packaging a little bit here and there. What, what kind of, apart from what you represent, right? Sure. What kind of tips do you give them that, okay, do this three or four things as I see this buyers and it will be easy for you to start? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to look at a couple of aspects. We have to look at their bottling line, okay. if they have one, and see what works for them. Understood. Because you don't want to go in if you're going to have to spend a quarter of a million dollars to redo your bottling true, line. True the economics of that may not, may so, not so, make So sense. you're suggesting so maybe in the same sort of uh, bottling line, if there was a lighter version of bottle. If there's, a, exactly, an you look at lightweight glass, uh, you look at alternative closures, um, maybe especially if the wine is being made for immediate consumption mm -hmm. or quick consumption, you can look at a synthetic closure like a Noma cork, mm -hmm. those, work, those work real well for, for that kind of thing. And they offer several different versions now for different storage mm -hmm. capabilities and Do, you know, are you seeing materials. trends in in bag uh, by box i mean you oh know. bag and box is absolutely growing. Are you seeing oh it growing? yeah it's okay. growing by 10 or 12 percent a year uh and there's some very successful brands out there with bag and box and bag and box is a great uh package mm -hmm. um, because it it allows for Portability, adaptability, and also wine in cans. Mm. Wine in cans is very popular, and 20 years ago, you couldn't sell a wine in a can. True, true. It's, I mean, an, it's an indication of the new consumer. That's uh, absolutely. I've, I've literally recently had, out of my last four airline flights, two were like literally just gave the can. So n not worried about right. nothing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I was just going to say about screw cap as well. Mm -hmm. So when, when I personally travel, I go for screw cap so I don't have to worry about wine opener being in the hotel room or this and that. Sure. You know, yeah, so. Exactly. And the thing about screw cap too is it, it does, especially for white wines and rosé wines, it really gives you a very true. fresh, clean tasting That's wine because there's no oxygen interaction because it's, a, it's really inert. Once you seal a wine with a screw cap, the wine doesn't change, whereas with a cork, there is some interaction between the oxygen that's already in the cork and the wine itself, which in red wines that are gonna age is a desirable True. thing, you want it. You agree to this that now it's absolutely not the fact that because you put a screw cap, your sales are gonna go down? Like absolutely people, it's not. It's gone now, that thing is gone completely. There are, there are still some people, yes. I, guess, I mean consumers, I'm think, saying macro data. Yeah, Let's say Nielsen, right. if we put, pull the data, do you think that if 
Yellowtail tomorrow goes in cork, their sales will increase versus today, let's say Yellowtail makes screw cap. Will it change just because of those reasons? Uh, no, I don't think that the screw cap is a detriment okay. uh, at all at all anymore mm, agreed, to agreed. it. Yeah. Although in, in many of the wine tastings I do, people still ask questions about it. In expensive wines yeah. maybe, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, for any wine that retails for less than $30 a bottle, there's, no, there's no reason to put a cork in it, unless it's a synthetic cork. Screw cap works fine. Mm. But if you've got a wine that's gonna be laid down in your cellar for 10 or 15 years and you want some of that oxygen interplay from the cork, then you want to stick with cork, but you know those corks are very expensive, and you still run a slight risk of cork taint. Cork, yeah, it's inevitable. It may only be two and a half or three percent, but at the seminar they were talking about this on Friday. If you had a two or three percent failure rate with aircraft travel, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't accept that. The wine industry is the only industry yeah. that accepts a predetermined failure rate for the, for their product. It's kind of funny. Thank you.